My name is Michael Flater. This is work done as a PhD candidate at MIT with my advisor, Devarvit Shaw. By the end of this talk, you'll have heard about an estimation task that is critical for anyone tracking the retail economy. What are consumers buying? This PhD work is now forming the basis for uh, startup covariance. So the problem set up is simple. Suppose you spend some amount at a store and from just your bill total, we want to infer what you bought. The punchline is, we actually solved this inference problem of inferring what customers are spending money on. And we show some surprising results at Netflix, Spotify, Apple, and Chipotle. So first I wanna give just a little background on the data we use in this work. There's an entire data industry devoted to tracking consumer spend. Hedge funds spend over a billion dollars here on data and related costs in the hope of being able to track sales at public companies better. Google buys credit card data to understand how online ads affect consumers shopping in physical retail stores. The category of alternative data includes any alternative to direct disclosures from companies. Direct disclosures would be things like SEC filings or press releases. Instead, alternative data is side channel information about companies and tries to measure consumer spending and retail sales in a roundabout way. The main theme of our work is that a lot of effort has been focused on finding new types of alternative data, but so far a lot less effort has gone into quantitative machine learning techniques that can be applied to these data sets. And that's the focus of our research. So the key type of alternative data that we use in this work is transactions data. So I wanna spend just a couple minutes on understanding transactions. So uh, suppose someone spends a total of $180 at Apple and they bought two items for 20 and 160. So we are interested in what they bought, but we'll settle for now on obtaining just their bill total. Maybe you know the person and they tell you that they spent $180. Or if they paid using a credit card, then if you are part of a payments network, you might see this bill total. Or maybe you are a large company and you issued them the credit card as part of a rewards program. Or it turns out that a small fraction of card payments end up in the hands of data vendors. So if you spent money at Apple, your bill total might be floating around in someone's data set right now. Anyone can buy this data. We note that personal information is not included in this data and the details of what you bought are not included either, just total numbers like $180. Of course, this is true not just for one person's bill total, but for millions of bill totals. Of the transactions that are not cash, some fraction of those bill totals end up in the hands of data vendors. Again, anyone can purchase this data. And this same setup holds for lots of companies, not just Apple. So for any company that lets consumers pay with credit or debit cards, some fraction of those bill totals may end up in commercially available data sets. This type of data on the right is alternative data. The, transac the transactions data that is for sale, this is alternative to direct disclosures from companies. Apple is not disclosing this information. The transactions are the exhaust data of the payment system. And it turns out that you can buy this. So alternative data like transactions reveals a tiny amount of information about companies in a very roundabout way. And here we observe some unknown fraction of total spending at a variety of companies. So we are interested in a uh, simple question. What are consumers buying? So if we pick a single bill total, like 180 at Apple, how many products did that one person buy? And what did that person pay for those products? So our data source for this work is data vendor second measure. And here we see transactions in the case of Chipotle, and we observe the individual bill totals of customers. Maybe our data contains your bill total if you went to Chipotle in the last couple of years. Then the question is, is it possible to tell what you bought, not just how much money you spent in total? That is, could we infer which products are selling? The key inference task is to take a vector of bill totals on the left and automatically infer product prices on the right. So we would like to know if 947 is the purchase of a single item. And if you spent 1628, that means you likely bought three different products. And if so, we want to know their prices. I'm not intending uh, for you to read this slide. Just the point is the algorithm is a little involved and I'll step through the intuition in a second. But just looking at the inputs, which are circled, we take a vector of bill totals, error tolerance, delta, which we'll explain, 
and a constraint K where you can assert things like no customers are going to purchase more than seven repeats or K repeats of any product. In other words, no one's buying seven sodas and nothing else at Chipotle. And this is a parameter or effectively a prior that the user can choose. I'm going to quickly step through a simplified uh, informal version of our method just to get some intuition on how we decompose bulk totals. The actual algorithm is a little more involved. In the paper, we provide a proof of accuracy under mild assumptions, along with a polynomial time implementation based on approximate subset sum. So the two key insights that allow us to do inference are first, if we have enough transactions, like millions of transactions, each product will eventually be purchased alone at least once. In other words, in a million transaction totals, someone will buy just a side order of guacamole and nothing else, even if it's unusual. The second insight is that we can only try and identify product purchases up to distinct pricing. So if two products both cost $10, there's simply not enough information for us to tell which product is purchased without additional assumptions. So stepping through the algorithm, first we sort distinct bill totals from smallest to largest. And we assert that the smallest bill total is a unique single product purchase, that's item one. And this follows from the assumptions. Next, we look at the $2 bill total and we ask first, is this $2 total close to item, the item one price? It's not. Is it close to the price of purchasing item one more than once, like $3 or $4.50, et cetera? It's not. So we add $2 as a new distinct product to the menu. Continuing $3.50, we approximate this as a combination of items on the inferred menu. And $4.9, we can also approximate as a combination of items on the inferred menu. So this is the intuition behind our algorithm. The key insight is that there is an underlying combinatorial structure. And in practice, uh, we also apply some pre-processing uh, pre to denoise the price data on the left, and then some post-processing to denoise the inferred menu prices on the right. And this tends to work very well in practice, as we'll see in a second. So now looking at some experimental results with real data, starting with Netflix, the data looks like this. Millions of rows, thousands of distinct bill totals. Already, this should sound strange to you. Netflix doesn't have that many products. It only sells a handful of subscription types. Why are people paying thousands of different prices for these products then? Maybe it's regional taxes or discounts or promotions, et cetera. The main question is, can we, re can we recover Netflix's product catalog from just a vector of bill totals? The answer turns out to be yes. So we get the first column of bill totals on the left, and that's it. And then our method produces the blue highlighted column, which are the inferred product prices or many prices. Then by hand for, the, uh, for these slides, we match the inferred prices to actual prices in Netflix's catalog. So now we're able to compute error in our method. In other words, we took millions of transactions total spanning thousands of distinct bill totals. And from that, we inferred just 11 product prices with less than 0.6% error. So the most interesting part of the inference is the 1708 product price or 1699 in the first column. This was not a product listed on Netflix's website at the time of this inference, but there were news articles that Netflix had a rumored limited release ultra high definition streaming package and that was priced at $16.99. So what's cool here is that our method discovered an unadvertised product. Similarly, for $18.45, we don't know if that inferred price corresponded to a real product, although checking this year, it actually does not correspond to a real product. So it's possible we saw an early release for Netflix's $18 product, which is now publicly available. Next, we do the same thing at Chipotle. The difference is Chipotle has tons of products, and there are millions of possible order combinations at Chipotle, even if you're spending just $10 to $20. The, the question is, can we infer key price points at Chipotle? And the answer is yes. So we use our method to take 133,000 Chipotle transactions with thousands of distinct bill totals. And we show that we can model these 133,000 transactions as being combinations of mostly 12 price points. In other words, we estimate that 12 key price points account for most of Chipotle sales. In fact, using our method, we can break down Chipotle sales according to price range. So for example, almost 80% of sales, we estimate to be in a really narrow $2 range from nine to $11, which makes sense because that's the cost of a chicken burrito and other products like that. So our contributions here are first, a novel inference, inference method along with a proof of accuracy under mild assumptions. 
the algorithm we provide is polynomial in time, which levers, leverages results based on approximate subset sum. Uh, next, experimental results. We completely recover the price catalog of Netflix, finding unadvertised hidden products. And at Spotify and Apple, uh, we can detect product launches automatically, detecting new price points or the launch of products at existing price points. For example, seeing surges in buying at existing price points. And we're able to decompose uh, bill totals into un underlying products with very low error. The results are significant because key questions for investors and competitors of any retailer are understanding changing price points, sales breakdowns, and customer spending habits. This concludes our work with identifying customer purchases using alternative data. If you're interested in this type of research, we'd love to hear from you. A company, Covariance, now specializes in applying machine learning to alternative data. We look forward to your questions.